Hey, welcome to our lookup series. We're now moved past uh, the life of Luther, but hey, there's still a Reformation going on, and there's still Lutherans around. In fact, there's still Lutherans up to this day. So we're going to now to start this process of bridging the gap uh, between the death of Luther to the modern day. It's a huge task. It's almost a 500-year-long uh, process. We want to hit the highlights, kind of zoom at a cruise control speed on the interstate. Once in a while, we'll take a little uh, bathroom break, uh, rest stop as it were, to examine some things in more detail to get you a feel for what's actually going on. So let's begin. For him today we're gonna do a Luther hymn, Lord keep us steadfast in your word. The original wording had been protect us from the murderous Pope and Turk, reflecting, hey God we have real physical enemies here on this earth, such as the Ottomans who are going to invade our country, and the Pope, who is actually threatening to kill us for not doing what he tells us to do. Uh, a real live threat. Maybe not the most politically correct threat, and also it really changes when the Turks aren't a problem anymore. Or what if you are a Christian who also happens to be a Turk? That's kind of awkward. Um, at that time, things were a little more black and white. The words got changed in today's version. The picture on the right does show a painting of the Turk army attacking Vienna, uh, this is during Luther's lifetime. All right, so last week, last episode, Luther died. Now it's a big question. So now what? <laughs> Whoa, there's Charles V charging back onto the scene. The timing couldn't have been better. He had by now defeated the Turks, defeated his pretty much lifelong rival, Francis, King of France, defeated the Pope even in Italy, and now he's finally back to enforce the Diet of Worms and to put down this Protestant Reformation and basically a Protestant rebellion if it gets that far. Well, there's John the Steadfast, the elector, uh, who was elector during the, the Schmalkald Articles, and now he's trying to enforce the Treaty of the Schmalkald League. He's thinking about doing a preemptive strike with his Lutheran forces, which included Philip of Hesse, uh, Mr. Two-Wife over there, um, and they're going to attack Charles V. Doesn't really work out. The guy on the left there, there's Moritz of Saxony, uh, you know, confusing two princes of Saxony. Well, we'll get into that in just a second, but Moritz, even though he's a Lutheran, sides with Charles. And we're going to see what happens in just a bit. But here, this is the very complicated family tree. Basically, what happened was, as we mentioned in the last episode, some of these German princes thought it was a good idea to split their lands and their territory between their sons instead of keeping it one nice, big, and actually effective, uh, large unit. So there you see Frederick II, the mild, the top left there, gave some of his land, including the title of elector, hey, you're one of the seven guys in the entire country who actually gets a vote, uh, his son Ernest, who was the elector of Saxony, but then Albert, Albrecht, he got kind of like the bigger, nicer cities of Leipzig and, and Dresden and Saxony. Well, Ernest kind of got the, the backwater of Wittenberg, and that's why they had to make a new university a few years before Luther turned up. Anyway, so you follow the family tree, you get Frederick the Wise, doesn't have any uh, kids that will be heirs, get John the Steady or, or John the Steadfast, and then you go down to John Frederick the uh, First. This is the one that was in charge of the Schmall called League. He's the one f trying to fight against Charles V. Go over to the right from the Albert line all the way down to the bottom right. There's there's Moritz, there's Maurice. His uncle, George the Bearded, was very, very Catholic. His father married a Lutheran and said, sure, that's fine, we'll be Lutheran. So Maurice or, or Moritz uh, grew up Lutheran, but for political reasons, he would really like to get that nice title of elector back. So he makes a deal with the emperor. Hey, even though I'm Lutheran, I'll side with you as you try to put down this Lutheran uh, Protestant movement if you give me that title of elector of Saxony. It's kind of the, the goal of his life. The goal of his family was to get that title ever since uh, the, the branches of the family split. Oh yeah, here's a nice, crazy, fun-looking map where, okay, so Albert gets all the nice cities like Dresden and Leipzig and the yellow, but 
Ernest gets the nice red stuff with Wittenberg and the title of Elector. That's what the country looked like. And oh yeah, there's some stuff on the top right that we're both going to have, and little parcels of land that don't even have major cities kind of dotted all over the place. Yeah, Germany at this time looked like this all across the map. Lots of tiny little uh, no sense making boundaries and territories. Really confusing, but would make a nice puzzle someday. All right, so here's the war, Schmalkaldic War. Uh, the League leaders were pretty much incompetent. They didn't have all the experience of fighting battles. Charles V, as mentioned earlier, had fought wars almost his entire life and, and won all of them. Uh, they didn't agree on anything. Well, Charles, Charles is going to win the Battle of, Mule, of Muehlberg. It's really the only major battle of the Schmalkaldic War. Many princes and reformers fled to England, so they did have an influence in the English Reformation. John Frederick was imprisoned, and so was Philip of Hesse. But John Frederick refused freedom when it was offered to him because it was on the condition that he would have to give up his faith or renounce it. Uh, he refused, and he got the title John the Steadfast, or St. John the Steadfast. And he encouraged his sons from prison by letter to do the same. Here's a painting showing kind of the later years of John the, the Steadfast, St. John the Steadfast's life. Uh, he was in prison, he was trying to conv be convinced, or people were trying to convince him to switch sides and give up his faith, but he refused. All right, here's a kind of a cartoon showing the powerful Charles V of Spain, of the Netherlands, of, of the Habsburg Empire in, in Central Europe, Holy Roman Empire. Oh yeah, and he also was in charge of all the Spanish colonies in North and South America. He is the most powerful man on earth, and he has won all of his wars from the Turks, the Pope, Francis, and now all these Lutheran upstart princes who rebelled against him. He gets to declare whatever he wants to declare now, and now he can enforce it. So he comes up with this Augsburg Interim. He ordered all Protestants to readopt traditional Catholic beliefs and practices, included, including having seven sacraments. He wanted to be nice, though, so he did allow for Protestant clergymen to marry and that the lay people could have communion in both kinds. They could have bread and wine. I know it doesn't sound like much, and I know it doesn't sound like it's being generous, but it's something, all right? But pastors who refused to follow the regulations of the Augsburg interim were removed from office and they were banished. Or if they didn't really want to leave, they were imprisoned and some were even executed. So if you wanted to teach that you're saved through Christ alone, by grace alone, through faith alone, you can have your head chopped off. All right, so now you get Maurice Moritz, the, the traitor. He's the elector now, by the way. He won and the emperor kept his deal. But he's still a Lutheran and he does kind of want to keep Lutheranism as a thing, and he works with Philip Melanchthon, uh, really the head of Lutheran theologian after Luther has died two years ago. Melanchthon wanted to compromise on doctrinal issues for the sake of peace. Not a good idea. So they worked on a modification of the Augsburg interim, trying to get a, a better deal, kind of like a plea bargain uh, in a court case. This caused a split in the Lutheran church body. So you had two sides. The Philippists, so you get kind of named as a heretic group now again as a Philippist, uh, and the Gnasio Lutherans, the, in other words, the genuine Lutherans. You had both sides saying, no, I'm really a real Lutheran. No, I'm really a real Lutheran. Philippists, though, are the ones who gave up on, on Lutheran teachings for the sake of compromise or peace. All right, then something kind of dramatic and crazy happens while Charles is out of town. Uh, Moritz switched sides. Look at him, the flip-flopper. He now allies himself with, with France and other countries, and he really just kicks Charles out of the country. Oh, did you see that? Yeah, that was real quick. Uh, Philip of Hesse escapes. Oh, yeah, and so does John the Steadfast. The Lutheran princes are out of prison, back in control. Of course, Moritz isn't going to give up that nice electorship title. John the Steadfast kind of gets some of his fringe backwater territories that he was still allowed to keep. Uh, Moritz, though, definitely has the lion's share of Saxony now. But Moritz did accomplish some good things for the Lutheran church. Charles just gives up on religious unity. He had been trying to enforce religious unity ever since the Diet of Worms, where he declared Luther a heretic and wanted just to nip that thing right in the bud. Uh, 
didn't work. He had decades and decades now of Lutheran reform going on. It had taken root, tried to enforce it. It just isn't going to happen. Charles, by this point, is sick of fighting wars all of his life, and he kind of retires. He gives Spain to his, his son and some of the, and the Spanish colonies and some other territories in Italy, and he gives his brother kind of the, the central Europe, the, the Netherlands and uh, Austria chunks. He just retires. Come up with the Peace of Augsburg, which is whoever reigns, it's his religion. That's what the Latin phrase there means. Basically saying, hey, it's up to the princes to decide what religion their country is going to have. So it's kind of like religious freedom for only the princes, but everyone else still has to do what someone else is telling them. Although in most cases, whatever the prince believes, the people were already believing. So it is kind of a natural solution to this problem. All right. We have one more uh, doctrine book, a, a symbolic Lutheran confession to get through. We're now several generations now from the start of the Reformation. These are new people, uh, not Luther. He's been dead for a while. So the elector of Saxony, so one of the Moritz descendants, wanted to kind of get together Lutheran teaching. It was a joint work of many theologians, but of most importance would be Martin Chemnitz and Jacob Andre. Martin Chemnitz wrote many other books and worked really hard to keep the Reformation movement going. So important that he gets the title as the second Martin, and then there was no other Martins after him. So Martin Luther, number one, Martin Chemnitz, number two. He was really that big of a deal. Well, why did you need this formula of Concord? There needed to be some unity uh, after that Philippist split, where Philip, well, he had his already the, the altered Augsburg Confession, and then he was just kind of doing that Leipzig interim where he wanted to give up on some Lutheran principles. So you got two groups of Lutherans, the genuine Lutherans and the Philippists. Well, this form of Concord was supposed to really clarify Lutheran teaching, and if you wanted to be a Lutheran pastor in pretty much most of any of the countries in Germany at this time, you had to subscribe, you had to sign your name to the formula of Concord. You had to agree with everything in it. But this formula was not accepted by many Lutheran countries, small principalities in many parts of Germany, and none of those Scandinavian countries uh, adopted it. Maybe because, hey, we already have like five or six confessions already, right? We kind of keep losing track here. Why do we need this formula of Concord? It kind of seems just like a German Lutheran problem right now. And this will have centuries long effects on, on a, kind of a, a divergence of Lutheran teaching and belief kind of starts to bump heads again later on in North America, but that's for another time. All right, so finally 1580, someone said, hey, let's just put all of the documents together uh, that we want to say uh, are symbols of our faith. They represent our faith. Anyone who says they're a Christian um, in our church, uh, they would agree with this because all of these teachings do teach what the Bible teaches. Uh, they're just kind of putting them in an organized, clear way. And that's also uh, discussing some false teachings too. So this is what the Bible says, and this isn't what the Bible says. Some of these are familiar. We say them in church, the Apostles' Creed, Nicene Creed, Maybe once a year we say the nice big uh, Athanasian Creed. If we wanted to say the Augsburg Confession in one service, uh, it would be probably the longest church service ever. It's kind of a, a lengthy document. The Apology of the Augsburg Confession, so the kind of the appendix or the addition to the Augsburg Confession, ex explaining more things. Small call articles, uh, the treatise and the power and primacy of the Pope, that was included in the first book of Concord. Uh, don't hear or see too much about that anymore. Of course, the small catechism, Martin Luther, anyone who went through catechism class, very familiar with that. Large catechism, talked about that before, something different, but it does uh, parallel the teachings of the small catechism. And of course, uh, as we just mentioned, the formula of Concord. This is the book of Concord. If you agree with all these documents as true representatives of what the Bible teaches, you are called a confessional Lutheran or an Orthodox Lutheran. All right, this is a Luther movie thing that we're doing right here. You should watch it sometime on your own. Okay, biblical principles time. God's peace. We talked a lot about peace, war, and unity in this session. 
Read 2 Kings 9, 17 through 22. If you need a pause to read or pause to answer the questions, please do so. So what was preventing peace in the land? What do you think? Is false teaching in one's country justification for war? Read Isaiah 57, 18 through 21. How does God define peace? Read Romans 5, 1 through 2. How do we have peace with God? Why is this the peace? Why is this peace the most important kind of peace? 1 Corinthians 1, 10 through 17. How well are we supposed to be united? How can we stay united? What should be our focus? Okay, move on to 1 Corinthians 12, 12 through 14, skip down to 27 and 31. In what way should diversity be celebrated in the church? Romans 16, verse 17. What kind of diversity is harmful, and what should we do with it? All right, taking it deeper. Luther had always argued that the Schmalkaldic League should only exist to protect the citizens in the League from attack, and never to wage war against the prince's higher earthly authority, Emperor Charles V. The princes argued that, according to the Constitution, they had the right to uphold the law, even by starting a war against the emperor. They were thinking, hey, we elected him anyway, so he's really answerable to them. React. Who is right? Is Luther right for showing honor and respect to those in authority? Kind of in line with the fourth commandment and uh, other teachings about authority in the Bible. Was the emperor right for striving for unity? Or were the princes right? Hey, they're protecting true doctrine and they're going to use er any means necessary to protect that doctrine. All right, let's close with prayer. Lord, keep us steadfast in your word. Let us find joy and strength in the diverse ways you have spread your gifts through the body of Christ in the church. Keep us on guard against any false teaching and give us the peace that comes through your Son. Amen.